Okay, it's recording. So yep. thank you all for being here and welcome to the Cape Elizabeth School Board meeting on Tuesday, October 13th, 2020. It's 6.30 p.m. Um, there is an executive session to follow. This is via Zoom. Uh, a roll call. Um, before we have the roll call, we have the strategic plan goals that we have decided to add to the agenda during our meetings. Um, just as a reminder, since these are the goals developed, the year plan uh, through the future search and over 100 community members, I'm not going to read them all. They are in the agenda packet, but I will review the subtitles. It's about health and well being, global competency, multiple pathways and definitions of success, safe, sustainable, and effective facilities, and environmental responsibilities. So, the roll call at this time, there is Hope as an attendee, Jen. I see her now. Okay, I'm pulling her over. Um, is Heather Altenberg here? Kimberly Carr? Here. Phil Saucier? Here. Elizabeth Seifries here. Nasser Shear is not here. Uh, Hope Straw, are you here? here? I'm here. Great. Hello. Welcome, welcome. And Laura Danino. I'm here. Great, thanks. Uh, can we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance yes. to the flag of the United States of America, of America and, and to the Republic, the Republic for which it stands, which stands one, nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice, and justice for all. all. Thank you. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Heather, it says on the on the top that there's an executive session, but there isn't one. So okay, thanks. Um, we'll take that out. Yep. Are there other adjustments to the agenda? Okay, seeing none. Are there comments? Um, can I have, excuse me, approval of minutes from September 8th, 2020? May I have a motion, please? I move we approve the minutes from our board meeting on September 8th, 2020. May I have a second? A I second that, Kimberly. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments? Okay, so voting, Heather Altenberg, yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Nasser is not here. Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Thank you. Um, so now we have, um, we have comments from the public on agenda items. Um, so Jen, how will this work? I see, okay, attendees. Emily Garvin, I believe I have to allow you to talk. Sorry, I'm talking out loud. Right, can I you hear me? Yes. yes, I can hear you, Emily. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. All right. Um, great. I am Emily Garvin. I live at 76 Oakhurst Road. I have a sixth grader and a sophomore in the hybrid maroon. Um, <clears throat> my question in a roundabout way, I can kind of probably make it fall under the Maine School Board Association resolution. Uh, related to the remote learning uh, agenda item, um, but I'm just grateful for a little bit of latitude here um, to ask questions about the Wednesday programming. Um, Wednesdays are a slower Emily, day. Emily, can I in interrupt you for one second? Yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to say that uh, public comment is not a back and forth in this format. We're happy to listen to you and take your questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I just yeah, want to make sure was... that um, oh, no. you're not yeah, expecting yeah. a response. Okay. Nope. Perfect. Nope. Not at all. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I, um, 
so anyways, qu uh, questions about Wednesday. Um, they're definitely a slower day in our house um, than the other um, extension days for uh, my family on Tuesdays and Fridays. Um, and I'm not asking for more extension work on Wednesdays by any means. Um, and I do understand what Wednesdays are for in the bigger picture. Um, however, I had a slightly different impression of how they would be used in the shorter weeks. Um, I listened to all of the calendar discussions over the summer, and I thought that Wednesdays were going to be used a little more creatively as needed um, throughout the school year. I know that now they're being used for teacher and staff professional development. Um, I, we just got an email that the sixth grade, at least the sixth grade, I'm not sure if more grades, um, are taking some standardized testing next Wednesday from home, um, which will be interesting, um, but I'm open. Um, so the confusion is just really with these short weeks and we have several coming up, including the one that we're in right now. Um, back when I went to order lunch for October, I noticed that Wednesdays were remaining a buffer day like any other five day uh, school week. And in just, I know that it wasn't official meeting discussion, but over the summer, um, there had been some talk about on these short weeks that the Monday, Tuesday, for example, on this particular week, would um, the Monday, Tuesday schedule would get pushed to Tuesday, Wednesday to allow, so again, using Wednesday as like this flex day. Um, I know it isn't a specific calendar issue because it's a, already a school day. So I understand that it probably wasn't discussed because it didn't technically have to get voted on because it's more how the schools use their, um, their Wednesday time. Um, and um, I know there's some grumblings in the parent community about Wednesdays and how they're being used um, that I've heard in my circles, um, but then maybe there would be some more support if the various school schedules were adjusted in the shorter weeks. Um, in addition to all the professional development and other creative ways, I know that my um, son's sixth grade class, they're trying to do other things, um, housekeeping things on those uh, Wednesdays as well. Um, so they are getting used creatively. It's just more of the short week um, issue. And the other question I have is just about the Wednesday, um, like office hours that are being promoted more for middle school and high school. Um, and just, is there a way to track how many kids are using the office hours and what might be a reasonable number um, to expect um, in order to support this block in the schedule? Um, in addition to the win at the middle school and the 1 uh, 25 p.m. to 2.25 p.m. support period at high school. Uh, are we talking like 25%, 50%? Um, I'm just curious if there's any thought to that going forward. Um, and also Emily, how many I'm gonna students? Have to, Emily, there's a two minute time frame. Oh, it's two minutes, so not three? You, no, it's two minutes. So I'm gonna give you a, a wrapping Can I have up. One more, I have one more question. Yes. One if more. You don't mind. I'm sorry, I didn't mention that ahead of time. No, that's it. I have one more question. Um, I just am um, asking um, how many students versus teachers are initiating the meetups on Wednesdays and are teachers still claiming kids like they used to before COVID? Um, anyways, that, that was it. Um, thank you so much. And um, yep, yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Emily. Sorry for interrupting you. I appreciate your interest and comments. Uh, Cindy Volts, I can unmute you if you can speak to uh, comments about things that are on the agenda and you have two minutes. Can you Hi, can, hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I have comments regarding um, a few things on the agenda. Two of um, the, the MSBA resolutions you have. Um, and then also um, the, the IPAD lease agreement, which is set to be voted on tonight. Um, in reading through the MSBA resolutions, in particular, the one regarding the development of a distance learning plan and um, the one regarding the equity in education, um, which I, both, I, I support both. I think they are both very important for our district. Uh, my concern is that <coughs> We are considering moving forward with a lease, a four-year lease, I believe, for iPad technology. And I'm wondering 
if any sort of assessment was done as it relates to distance learning and the technology needs for distance learning and the appropriateness of an iPad for that learning and also the appropriateness of an iPad overall for our students, um, especially our older learners in middle and high school. And I think this plays significantly into um, the equity and education opportunities as well. I know as the parent of a high schooler, um, my child has her own laptop and is using that in addition to the school issue at iPad. I've spoken with other parents, some who do not have the means to provide a separate laptop for their children, and their children are um, at a bit of a disadvantage. They're having to print things and write on them and take pictures of them and send them back in order to do some of their work. Um, and then I've talked to other parents who said, oh yeah, we, we just bought our child a, a laptop for the year. So I think, again, particularly in the older grades, the middle and high school grades, iPads are not necessarily an appropriate tool. And before moving forward with a commitment to that technology, particularly in light of the, both the strategic goals the district has laid out and the MSBA resolutions that you're passing, um, that you take a strong look at the appropriateness of the technology of an iPad versus a laptop um, uh, for for our, particularly for our older students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cindy. Um, okay, Wynn is next. You should be able to speak if you unmute yourself. I think I unmuted myself, yes. Yep. Okay. We uh, can hear you. You're a little bit quiet, but I can hear you. I'll try, I'll try to yell. That's a little better. Oh my God. All right. So anyway, I just wanted to comment. Uh, I wasn't going to comment, but I want to comment on this Wednesday um, thing very quickly. And one of the things I, I think that um, everyone has to realize is that doing this type of learning and or actually more doing this type of teaching, I'm sorry, is um, takes a lot. It's a lot more than what you would ever think. It's learning, it's not only just learning the technology, but manipulating the technology, using the technology in the classroom, uh, trying to keep um, an eye on kids on screen as well as kids right in front of you. Those are all um, incredibly draining. And I would say that um, um, I'm, I'm worn out every day. The Wednesdays have been good for, um, for, the, uh, for um, prep, uh, preparation, and this is particularly true in the elementary school where um, teachers have lost um, prep time this year. Um, they're down from 45 minutes to 30 minutes now, and um, and sometimes that time is taken up by teachers, uh, uh, allied arts teachers being in the classroom. So imagine trying to prepare a lesson while, or try to prepare a meeting while someone is in your room having a meeting. So the Wednesdays have be, been incredibly valuable to teachers um, for, the, for the reason of, uh, especially the elementary school teachers, for getting um, classes ready. And I know that the policy committee, um, uh, I'm hoping, is addressing the, the planning time issue, um, but it is a big thing and Wednesdays are important. And I'm not denying that there's been some loss of instruction, but that's part of um, this whole mess. Um, but uh, just just carefully consider what happens with Wednesday, um, and uh, and and pay attention, please, to what teachers have to say about um, how the schedule is working. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Um, okay, Audra Gore. You should be able to speak at this point. Thank you. Yes, Audra Gore, 215, Two Lights Road. I wanted to say that I'm delighted that added for consideration for the 2020-2021 goals that the work of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force found its way on there. So I, I'm very grateful. Thank you for adding that. Um, so as a parent, yay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks for sharing that and the endorsements. Okay, I'm not seeing other hands raised. 
So that brings us to comments from our student representatives. We have um, Ellie Gagney and Hannah Leith. Welcome this year. I'm so glad I'm trying to find you. There's Hannah. Oh, and there's Ellie right below. Welcome. Hi. So glad you're here. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thank you. Um, so can I just go right into it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I was going to touch on like three different topics that I talked about with Mr. Shedd and Hannah will follow up with them. But my first topic is how hybrid learning is going for students. And when I say I, I'm just like I, speaking on behalf of what I've heard in the high school. Um, so to begin, I'd say the general consensus is that it's going fairly well. From what I've heard, people are still succeeding in school and aren't being too overwhelmed with regards to schoolwork. And to add to Mr. Phillips, the Wednesday thing I would say is huge uh, success. I think people need those days. I know I get home from school and I need to take a nap and then go to sports. And so that day like gives us a buffer to just relax and take a deep breath from the hour long classes that we're going through. Um, and I think this upcoming transition is gonna be a huge like telling point in all of this because many students had tough classes this semester and are going into e an easier mini term or from my point of view i had my easy classes this first mini term and i'm going into tougher classes so i think that should be an interesting transition but i'd say overall the pros of hybrid learning are getting a bit more of a relaxed schedule having more freedom to leave school for upperclassmen getting wednesdays to meet with teachers if needed and taking some pressure off a jam-packed schedule. Um, some cons would obviously be missing out on extracurricular events and not getting to see everyone in school, but um, that's nothing we can figure out right now, obviously. And then some other things were the class activities in these, this time of COVID. The Junior Student Council has been planning, uh, has had meetings every Thursday and been planning to do a makeshift spirit week so the way that will work is the in-person days you dress up and we're going to extend it for two weeks. So you have four days of like uh, of dressing up. Otherwise, I feel like the showing on Zoom won't be very high. So and then we're also trying to figure out some sort of pep rally, but we're, we've been tossing around many ideas. One idea we had was to do um, a music video of some sort. So similar to what seniors have done in the past where they make a lip sync video, obviously we couldn't do that with masks, but a music video, um, each class will do that and it'll be a competition and maybe we can do it over the span of that two weeks. And then we are also, the Junior Student Council is also planning prom. And right now we have venue secured, which is the landing, which Hannah, that her student council paid for last year and instead of giving them a refund, they said it could carry over to the next year. So we have that uh, all booked and then we're gonna find a DJ, but we're trying to take it slow right now since we obviously don't know how everything's gonna play out. And lastly, to touch on the athletics going on in the clubs, um, we had a video, we watched an advisory, I think two weeks ago where I think it was mostly for the freshmen and sophomores, I guess, about uh, all the clubs that the high school provides, but I believe it went pretty well, although I haven't heard of many club meetings yet, at least for what I'm in. And Hannah's going to talk about this more, but the athletics are providing definitely a sense of normalcy right now. And I know I can speak for the soccer team by saying we are having a lot of fun and the, that hour or hour and a half we're out on the field is the only time where we get to like breathe and take our masks off and that's been very important and then along with the soccer team the football team is still getting practices in which is good and uh i've heard from them that they're still having fun despite not being able to play real games so yeah thank you 
Hi, I'm Hannah Lease. Um, I'm the senior class president. I just wanted to take a moment on behalf of the school to thank all the school board members for your hard work during the summer, as well as right now to give us the hybrid learning and give us a sense of normalcy, as well as a shout out to our teachers for working so hard and allowing us to learn and just feel normal in the classroom and giving us the need, the help when we need it. Um, so I'm going to give you guys a few updates on the class as well as the school as a whole. I've been super impressed with our school with following all the safety guidelines, wearing our masks, social, social distancing, as well as following the arrows. Um, I think the senior privileges and upperclassmen privileges have been extremely nice with being able to go outside, get a breath, and just have a break in between our classes. Um, our teachers have been doing a really great job in learning all of the online stuff and being able to teach us succinctly and in a proper manner where we can still learn in a fast paced learning environment. Um, I think the difference between March and now is astronomical and I'm so proud of our teachers for all their hard work with that. Uh, the teachers are really challenging us with the curriculum, especially with the mini term schedule. Uh, the AP courses have a succinct, succinct course now, so we have to do a faster pace. And a shout out to the, all those AP teachers for working so hard for that because I'm taking four classes right now, AP classes, and I really appreciate those teachers putting in all that hard work. Um, echoing off of Ellie, the sports have been going extremely well. Everyone has been following the rules. I think that the sports are so, so important to make sure those happen in the following seasons, including the winter months, even though that COVID could get higher because they give us a sense of normalcy. And I've heard, I'm not doing a, a school sport at the moment, but I've heard from many of the fall sports that it's been giving them a sense of normalcy and keeping their mental health sane. So, um, and then as well, Last week, we saw a video as well as a presentation by Mr. Cohan that explained all of the clubs. And I think that's been super helpful, especially for the freshmen who, this is their first experience in the high school. And I think looking back into me as freshman year, this would be extremely difficult to adjusting into high school. And I think we've done an awesome job in allowing those freshmen to feel at home here. A uh, little update on the senior class. We have handed out our senior t-shirts. We had a senior sunrise a few weeks ago. Uh, we're working out the details for a senior class picture. We're thinking about doing the maroon and gold groups separately and then photoshopping those together as one. Um, we're trying really hard to come up with creative senior activities that follow the main guidelines, but I think we will need your help to make sure that these senior activities get approved and passed because this has been extremely important to us to making sure our senior year is somewhat normal and we get to end our Cape Elizabeth High School experience on a high note. Um, a few things that I want to touch on that I think we could improve on or just to bring up to think about is trying to balance our many terms. So, for example, I'm taking four AP classes this many term and I know some of my fellow students who are, have two study halls adventure in a math class. So I think trying to work on balancing these terms workload wise will help immensely in people's mental health and making sure they, they get all their work done. I understand that it might be difficult to for scheduling, but I think that keeping that in mind is extremely important. And then a thing that was brought up earlier in the meeting is the importance of the Wednesdays. Um, one thing I've noticed, especially with myself, is how fatigued I feel after the remote days. The difference between hybrid learning days in person and online is extra, like the difference in feeling fatigued and tired is extreme. For most, at least for me with remote days, I, I need a nap. After my five hours online, I need a nap, and then I have six hours of homework to do online. So I think having those Wednesdays is a must to be able to meet with your teachers, catch up on work, and even get a few extra hours of sleep to make sure you can finish the week strong. I think one thing as a school that we can work on and the school board can help as well is making sure we check on the full remote students to making sure they are doing okay mental health wise because you, we, they don't have the social interactions that the hybrid students do. So I think that's super important. And then... The last thing I had to bring up was making sure that the CP and honors kids get to complete their 
entire curriculum because AP students have a um, compact schedule. So we are on a tight schedule to making sure we're learning everything, but to make sure that the CP and honors kids also get to complete their education with those classes. And that's it for me. Thank you. Well, Ellie and Hannah, thank you so much for those updates and um, that perspective from the students in the schools. It sounds like things are going relatively well and that's great to hear. So um, thanks for offering what you did. Uh, next up, <clears throat> we have presentations. Um, the retirement of Janet Hopkins and Pat Fowler, both in the transportation and facilities department. Um, so I'm, 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 to, gonna, I'm going to start. Um, there's Janet. Yeah, I, I, is Pat here? She is, but she's her her video is off. I don't know. I, I, we can't I, see I, her, but hopefully she's hearing us. Yeah. Probably. There she is. There she is. Oh, there's Pat. 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 And Janet, um, thank you. I I spent some time last Wednesday. This is what I did with my Wednesday morning last Wednesday. Um, going through. Um, the files of each of these um, wonderful women. And the files are like this thick of all the many things that they've done in the district. I was just, I was amazed. And it was, it was such a fun thing to do. Um, and I'm gonna share some of the things that they've done with you. And I'm gonna start with Janet and then Perry's going to say some words about Janet and then, and then I'll read what I found out about Pat. So um, this is what I found out about Janet. She started working for the district in 1988 as the assistant director of community services. And then she took over as the director of community services around 2008. And then in 2012, she moved over to facilities and transportation, transportation where um, in about 2017, she was promoted to operations manager for, for the department. She also, and I had no idea about this, uh, worked in Cape Elizabeth as a varsity softball coach, as the assistant athletic director, um, as the eighth grade field hockey coach, uh, as the varsity field hockey coach, and at one time she was the alcohol and other drug prevention coordinator. And she helped to organize several Cape Elizabeth Memorial Day ceremonies. And another interesting fact is that um, from 1984 to 90, 1992, she served as the Maine Field Hockey Association Secretary. So I found that was, out that was, thought that was really interesting. So Janet, you have been busy. So Perry, do you, do you wanna add some things about Janet? <laughs> uh, with, with both Janet and Pat, I could go on all night long and just consume your entire meeting. <laughs> I, I just, I do have, I mean, I, I can't really put it into words. I mean, uh, Janet has always, always gone the extra mile for me. Uh, ever since the day that I walked in the door at Cape Elizabeth, um, I walked into a department that um, it, it, there, there was a lot to take on with, with, with our, with our facility team that covers the, all the town buildings there's just an extreme amount of information and both her and Pat were there to provide that information to me and help me come on board and get up to speed. It took me probably at least a year to get there, but uh, she supported me all through the way and still does to this day. Um, let's see, I, I just got a couple bullets here. Um, oh, Janet has always done more then, then I'll say what was required of her position. And I'll give a for instance, um, I'm, I'm also the town liaison to the energy committee. And one day I came back to the office after the energy committee the night before and loaded me up with all these tasks to do and uh, to gain them information on all the electrical usage in the buildings and fuel usage. And I came into the office and I said, Janet, I said, is there any way that you can you know, pull this information together for me. Uh, they're looking for a year's worth of energy usage on every single building we have within the town. And about five minutes later, she comes back to my desk with a spreadsheet. Hey, you're here, everything, this is all you need. And then added fuel to it as well, including propane and oil. And I mean, it's just the, the documentation that she carries with her is just uh, second to none. Um, let's see, 
I, she knows my big thing is payroll. Uh, payroll in our department is a difficult thing to do, and she has always been there for me. Um, I, I will tell everybody here and confess, there's been times where Janet has done payroll for me while she's on vacation. Just because she knows I don't like it that much, and it's just, it's a difficult thing to do, but she's got it figured out and, uh, and, and is pretty smooth with getting it done quickly. Uh, she's always taking care of the site supervisor training, uh, training other people to work in our buildings after hours and seeing that they have all the safety training needed. Um, taking care of the weekly schedules throughout the town, sporting fields, things that are scheduled within the buildings, always seeing that that's covered so that we don't have double booking in places. Um, and helping out with Beach to Beacon and, uh, and preparing for that as well. I, I believe that's more of a, a volunteer thing, but that just goes to show that uh, always going above and beyond what's asked of her. Um, very supportive. Uh, we have David Bagdasarian who started uh, in our office, I believe, a week ago and was very supportive at helping to get him on board and uh, I believe is working in the business office now. I, I I said to the people in the business office, my loss is is your gain. So, um, that's all I got. I I'm gonna wrap wrap it up when I finish with uh, Pat, and uh, that's it. Anybody else have anything they want to say about Janet? No. Nope. One of the things that um, somehow Janet always knows when I'm stressed, and I don't know how she knows this, but from time to time, I'll get a little card from her with some encouraging words, and I have so appreciated that. So thank you, Janet. Now, this is what I found out about Pat. Pat has worked in Cape Elizabeth since 1987, when she started at the Thomas Memorial Library as a secretary receptionist. And then she was a substitute teacher, and then she worked several years as an ed tech one in the middle school and as community services secretary. Uh, she was attendance coordinator at the middle school, yearbook advisor at the middle school. Uh, uh, she was a secretary at the high school and a secretary for community service services. And her, it seems that her job has had many different titles um, <laughs> over there in the transportation department. And were you a bus driver at one point, Pat? No, okay. <laughs> um, system scheduler, transportation supervisor, and transportation scheduler. So I'm not even sure if those are different jobs or if they're all the same job. But um, uh, anyway, she's, she also has been a very busy person um, in Cape Elizabeth. So thank you, Pat, for all you've done. Perry? Yeah. I the the facilities department requires I, I, all of our staff is is kind of required to be a little bit of a chameleon and, and take on any job i used to plan my day before coming into work i don't even bother anymore because it's usually completely opposite of what i was thinking it was going to be um but you know both janet and pat have taken on those roles as taking on other duties that may not fall under their job description uh and they've done it great uh pat has you know, on, on a daily basis is always organizing uh, the, and scheduling the drivers. Many times at the last minute, <clears throat> we'll get a, uh, a sporting event or a field trip uh, thrown at us at the last minute. And she's always going above and beyond to scramble and get a driver so that um, we can provide that transportation. I will say that she knows every road <laughs> in Cape Elizabeth. And I'll probably throw some goat paths in there as well. Uh, she knows... She knows all about the ins and outs of Cape Elizabeth. Um, and also, uh, let's see. Oh, and uh, there's, been a, there's been quite a few times, and I, I can't point one out, but I know it's happened, uh, yeah, a few times that uh, she's taken care of business outside of work hours. It, it may be something as simple as driving by town hall and seeing that some lights were left on. Um, and we'll just pull in and, and make sure that those lights are off so they're not on for the entire weekend. Just just little things like that as part of being a resident within the town, but it goes above and beyond even outside of hours and, and not asking to be compensated in any way for that work. <clears throat> um, 
just recently, and I, and I love this, uh, anytime I can get some, uh, paperwork simplified, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of it. And she's figured out a way to uh, simplify the state required annual reports that I need to do and basically has taken the what you see on the web page and printed it out and just filled in the blank. So it's really verbatim. When I go to, when I go to do the annual reports, all I do is put the numbers right in the boxes where they belong. She's done all the, all the labor for me. And um, let's see. And, and just the overall scene of the sa safety of all the students, staff, coaches, community members, anybody who rides on our buses. Um, she's there taking part in the bus driver's training. She's getting training at, um, through webinars and different uh, events that she goes to. Uh, sometime we have an annual meeting up at Sugarloaf that she'll run up to and, and uh, come back with some valuable information from that. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, she's always been there for everybody who rides on our buses and seeing it there in the uh, safest transportation possible. Um, both, both Janet and Pat are, are, for the most part, irreplaceable to me. I have been extremely blessed to, to be able to work with them. They're two of Cape Elizabeth's finest employees, and um, they will be sorely missed. Um, I'm hoping they pop in from time to time and see if I'm drowning. <laughs> but yeah, that's it. I just wanted to say thank you to both of you for... Uh, my four, four and a half years here, uh, it's been a pleasure, all mine. I think we also have to acknowledge the amazing job Pat did at the end of the summer with doing the bus routes because she had very little time, what, a week or maybe, maybe two weeks at the most um, to get those bus routes under control and she did it and the bus drivers were smiling and I didn't, I didn't hear any complaints about buses. So yes. that, that was an amazing feat. Um, that was, it was just, it was just amazing. So Pat and Janet, we're really going to miss you, but Janet's coming to visit us in, in the business office. So we're so happy to have her. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you for being here, Janet and Pat, to, be able to honor you and yeah to be able to hear all these wonderful things um you both are icons in this town <laughs> you know i mean everybody knows janet and pat and uh yeah we really so appreciate all that you've given so thank you for attending this meeting tonight um our next recognition is for caitlin ramsey um I have heard nothing but amazing words about Caitlin since she came to this school. Um, the positive influence she's had on students over the years and this program and how she's built it up and the respect she has gained from her students and staff members. And she is formally recognized as Maine Music Educator of the Year. So congratulations, Caitlin. Caitlin, thank you for being here. Um, I don't know if there's anybody else who would like to speak. Troy, maybe, Troy, or? Troy has something to say, I think. Sure. I think I can do that. Can somebody make me a co-host? I got a couple of pictures that I want to share. Uh, with you. Oh! <laughs> if I can do that, it's feeling pretty. I can do that. So while, while we're trying to do that, um, <laughs> I had done a little research today. I had made great plans to talk about the history of Caitlin. Then I just heard all of that. <laughs> very much like a retirement thing. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to scrap <laughs> the, Caitlin's been here for seven years and all of that. Um, I would add that being fairly new to the district, it was pretty intimidating walking into the office with Janet on one side and Pat on the other. <laughs> so it's like, you could just tell there was a lot of knowledge there and, and how helpful they are. So they will definitely be missed, even though I'm, I don't work with them every day. It's, it's, you, know where the, you know where the strength of the district lies, um, and they're a huge part of it, so they definitely will be missed. Um, as far as Caitlin goes, I don't know what else to say about Caitlin except for just how incredibly strong I find her to be. Um, she has that unique ability to challenge kids, very young kids, fifth grade, sixth grade, um, without pushing them away, which I think is a complete skill. Um, 
and they know that at her heart she believes in them and wants them to be great at whatever they do. So I think that really has a lot to do with it. Um, I'm going to try really quickly, and then I'm. But I just want you to see a couple of pictures of what the uh, music teacher of the year um, looks like. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> right now and during these times, our Allied Arts team is working completely remote. So I don't know if you guys can see that, but um, that was this morning. So I went in this morning, I said, hey, sorry to do this to you. I know that you kind of hate this, but I need to take your picture. Um, so you'll see there, like this took hours for Caitlin to figure out how to, not just how to teach, but how to do it and, and still be great. Um, and all of that stuff is borrowed or stolen, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, the ring lights and the monitors and the speakers and, and I just, I asked her, you know, I kind of got her picture because she couldn't get away. She's kind of trapped in that little place. And um, to see how she manipulates all of that and, and to teach the different courses and to have, you know, move in a drum or to play, you know, the trumpet or whatever so that kids can see it and the fingernail polish on the keys and all of the things. It's just, it's really, I find it to be amazing, you know, that she's been able to do that. And there's another shot of, of what that, what she goes through every day because she's full remote um, and how much and how, just how impressive that is to me is, is beyond what I can comprehend doing every day. Um, so I asked some people to send me some quick messages. Um, and really, I, the one I got, and she said I could reword it, but I'm not going to. I think it's really important to, for everybody to hear. This is from Emily LeBourne. So it's Caitlin's teaching partner, essentially, in the music program. Um, she said that 14 different people wrote letters of support for Caitlin to receive this award. Um, Emily had originally reached out to four people and then more and more past and current students and parents and colleagues heard about the nomination and wanted to write letters of support. Um, Caitlin does not take time off from her job. She spent every day this summer working, reworking her program um, to be accessible to students in remote situations. She hosted frequent virtual meetings all summer with main band directors to brainstorm how to keep bands going um, and how to be uh, the support for each other. Every few weeks, an educator from the state will reach out to Caitlin to try and figure out how to copy her program. The, program, the problem is um, they'll never really be able to do that because Caitlin is that special glue that makes the Kate Music uh, Department what we are. No one is as dedicated or passionate about middle school band. Being a band director isn't a job for Caitlin. It's a passion and she works daily to support her students to be successful. I didn't think I could do justice by paraphrasing that. I think that means a lot when your coworkers can say something like that about you. Um, and it just goes to show the impact I think that you have on, on everyone. So um, couldn't be a better person. I, I go in and I always can find Caitlin working on something to make it better for kids. Um, and everything that she, she is just unique and she, she, we're incredibly fortunate to have her. Um, so that's really all I have to say other than congratulations, well-deserved. Um, I, I really, COVID has done, it does a lot of things to us. And one thing that it's made very hard is to celebrate successes um, the way that we typically would. So retirements, um, new hires, and, and awards. I just, it's really struggling. So I appreciate this forum to do it. And, and I'm glad I think she's here somewhere in the audience. So um, congratulations, Caitlin. Thank you, Joy. <laughs> The next on the agenda is the recognition of the Pond Cove Elementary School Blue Ribbon Award. Um, Jason, will you, are you able to speak to that? Congratulations. I can, thank you so much. Um, I, it, it really is an honor. Um, and, you know, there's been, there's been some great newspaper coverage and, and there's a lot of information out there, but I really tonight wanted to just speak to um, the, the, the folks that really make it all happen. And so of course, I think in a school, in any school, um, you know, we have our teachers and, and teachers and support staff, and we have our students and we have our parents. And um, I just, I can't say enough about all three of those, those groups. Uh, our teachers and, and support staff uh, really make the school, they can just completely make the school what it is. It's just such, such an outstanding um, place to, to learn and to work. 
and um, you know our students are are outstanding as well and and they come to school ready to learn and we we owe that to the parents um, and in addition to you know sending sending us students who are really ready to learn um, our parents are highly involved they ask great questions they push us to be our very best and um, I think you know that's how that's how we accomplish this all together as a team and um, it's really an honor to be a part of it do you have any questions Heather at all about anything or anything you think I should mention um, about the application process or anything like that if you, I mean, if you want to take a quick review of the application process, that would be beneficial for the community. Sure, I, don't, I didn't know how much time you wanted to spend, but I, I think I appreciate this. Um, yeah. So the application process is quite rigorous, actually, where um, we, are, we are nominated based on, you know, at first we were nominated as a high performing school based on our performance. But then the, the application process is really several months long and um, it's, it's actually, um, it's public, so I'm not sure if we have it on our website yet, but um, if not, we'll have access to that on our website and everyone can see it. Um, it the application process involves several different staff members because it's so comprehensive. Um, we, we collaborated with different departments um, throughout the school to complete all the different questions and sections about um, academic programming, about uh, student supports, about um, the arts, every aspect of a school. Um, and we had to do a lot of writing um, kind of, and it was, it's great writing to do because you're really showing off all, all the, the cool things that, that your school does. Um, so it, it took, it was, it's a few month process to complete the application. And um, we found out just a few weeks ago that we had received the award and um, there's just a lot to celebrate. Well, congratulations. I think Troy yeah. said it well. It's very, um, it's wonderful to be able to celebrate successes okay. in this yeah. time. So. And a very needed time. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the recognition tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, moving on, we have administrative reports from the principals. Jason, do you want to just keep on going? I can. You know I can, right? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, you know, in, tonight, really, my plan was to thank a lot of the same people, but I will, um, I will just share a little bit about kind of what's been going on at Pond Cove and um, I have been, I've been kind of working with, with um, our remote teachers and beginning to sit in on some of the morning meetings with our fully remote students and follow their programming through all the, the um, Google Classrooms and, and emails to parents. Uh, and I'm very, very pleased and I know that parents are very pleased. Um, nothing's perfect but I think our fully remote team, our teaching team is just doing an outstanding job of doing everything they can to engage and motivate students in a, you know, given the platform that they're provided. And in terms of the hybrid programming, um, you know, I've seen every aspect, uh, classrooms and lunches and recess and, and support um, services. And again, I thank the teachers uh, for uh, just going above and beyond um, to make this experience all that it can be for students and families. And uh, I've had a meeting today with um, the Pond Cove leadership team and the, the teachers were just commenting on how resilient and how well our students are doing, um, wearing masks and, and physically distancing and engaging in school at the same time. So we're all very proud of them. Um, you know, and again, just to thank, thank the parents, all the parents for being patient and understanding yet continuing to ask great, great questions, give feedback. Uh, that's how we get better at what we're doing from hearing that, that um, student and parent perspective from home. So I really appreciate that. 
Thank you, Troy. Uh, thank you, Troy. Sorry <laughs> about that, Jason. <laughs> Troy. All right. So, um, yeah. So mine is is very much similar to what to what Jason just said. I mean, I, I think we're we're finally getting to the point where schools are kind of running a little bit now and routines have started. And I think families are starting to get into those routines and students and teachers. Um, I would agree uh, with what Wynn, I'd kind of echo what Wynn said and, and the student reps just, it's, we have to remember it's a very different experience. Um, we're still in a pandemic and there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of stress within the community. There's a lot of stress within our teachers own lives. And, and it, it is a challenge and it's very different and things um, we're asking people to teach in a way they've never taught before. And I think we're changing education for the future, honestly. Um, we're just living it by force. It's not a course we're taking, it's reality. Um, so it's, I, I continue to be very impressed with the, what our remote teachers have been able to, to tackle, just kind of take it on full speed and, and make it work. I mean, we've gone from, struggling to get students to sign in and log on to that's pretty much worked itself out now. Um, our next step really, and it, and it really does is dependent largely on feedback from parents and we really count on it. Um, we're working, I think as a district, but I know at the middle school, we started talking about what are the, what are the, what does Google classroom have to look like? Um, and what is some of the common language that parents are needing and searching for? Um, we've, we've all transitioned. So that's the one platform we use. And now we're trying to get kind of streamline our, our uses of it. So those are kind of some of the continued learning that seems very easy to do, but yet it's really a large change and it takes a lot of kind of practice and conversation to make that happen. Um, everybody's been doing things the way they think works best. So it's really a matter of coming up with some solid agreement. So that's a work in progress. I believe um, the tech integrators may be hosting. I know Jonathan's working on, you know, a parent night for Google Classroom and, and what to expect and some common common questions. So that stuff is up and running and I feel pretty good about all of that. The, really one of the things I wanna do is just highlight the fact that um, parent-teacher conferences are coming up. And I think our parents are a little worried knowing I may have only seen kids eight times by right now. Traditionally, I would have seen them maybe 20 times, you know, so what a parent-teacher conference may have looked like in the past I think our teachers are a little anxious around what they can give parents for feedback. And, you know, it's really, I think, going to be almost an open house slash parent conference. Um, and, you know, what do you need from us? How's it working at home? How can we support your family at home? You know, and those kind of questions, I think, are really going to be important for this parent round of parent-teacher conferences um, as we move forward. So that will be coming out shortly. And then just really quickly, I don't want to talk all night. But I have to just, there's so many people to thank this year because it all, everybody is really required to do a lot in order to make it happen. Right from the custodial staff to the tech team, um, the tech team has been amazing. And without their support and work, we would not be up and running. Um, our nurses, our food service, you know, they've tackled this whole new food program ordering system. And, um, and it's just, they've done an amazing job, honestly. Um, and our teachers are, are really kind of picking it up and running with it. So I, I'm really thankful for all of those things happening. Um, and really the, the, the big part for us, is, and I keep saying it in my million letters that I write to parents, is really let us know. We're working, we're going to be flexible to find a balance for you and your family. Um, some families have children at daycare, some don't. Some <laughs> we are feeling overwhelmed, some want more rigor in their off days. So there's really not a one size fits all model and we just need to be flexible and communicate and work with parents. So that's kind of where we are right now. And um, other than that, I, I feel like, I feel like we're starting to get some traction and that's, I think that's part of the Wednesdays and using those times. Um, and as far as to kind of answer Emily's question, I believe our teachers are keeping track of who they're meeting with and when the Wednesdays are also sometimes for, you know, academic supports. I know some of our IEP students are still getting services during those days. So I know Caitlin is doing some band during those days. Just there's not enough time in a, in a day. So there's always something that leaks into those days. Um, our NWEA testing is gonna be remote as she said on, and I just sent that letter out. Um, it's really important that we get some baseline assessments and that's a way to do it. And we're doing it on the Wednesday mornings to avoid losing those Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday days. Um, so 
So that's kind of where we are. I feel like things are going pretty well. As Jason said, always room for improvement, but we only will improve with what we know from parents. So I'm looking forward to their conversations with teachers, getting that feedback and applying some of it. Thanks, Troy. I think it's important to, <clears throat> that you brought up the parent-teacher conferences that um, it really sounds like it's gonna be more of a dialogue of how are things going and that um, the parent input will be just as vital as the teacher input is what I heard from you. So um, like everything, it's gonna be different. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, Jeff, the high school. Hi, Heather. Um, so I, th I think I want to try to make four points um, about how things are going so far. Um, first, I would I think echo what Jason and Troy are saying in terms of safety and health issues, which is, are definitely the top priority. I'm, I'm really overall very pleased with the way things are going. I think that dividing the kids into gold and maroon has helped tremendously. It reduces the amount of traffic. Um, in the high school, having just four periods a day, four classes a day, has reduced the number of students going through um, classes. It's calmed, thing, it's calmed things down. It's reduced the number of transitions. Um, the mini term, it has its pluses and minuses, but what it has done is it has reduced the number of students who are going through any given classroom during a period of time, which I think is really helpful. Um, I will say that I've received a lot of feedback from quite a few students that the mini term approach, and this is particularly oh, wow. true of students who struggled with remote learning the most in the spring, um, who are students who, are, uh, who have some weaknesses in executive functioning and, and that sort of thing. They pretty strongly report that the mini term approach, even though teachers are giving more work in every class than they might normally, because they know the students are only taking half their course load, they report that it's, it's really helpful to them to have, um, have fewer things to juggle at one time. Um, the school overall feels calm and quiet, and I'm going to come back to that at the end. It's sort of my fourth point because there's a flip side to that as well. Um, second, I want to echo what staff and, the, and the, the student reporters suggested about how hard staff are working, and that's true at all three schools, I know. Um, they're not whining about it. They're not complaining about it. They're doing it. They're staying positive, uh, but they are working really hard. Um, so at the high school, um, just because of the nature of high school, not because of anything else, our teachers are teaching their kids, all their kids, whether they're home or in school, uh, four times a week. So Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, they're having contact with kids and actively instructing kids. The miracle that, it, that allows us to accomplish that is to me uh, the technology that allows us to accomplish it. Still, I can't get over it. still seems quite miraculous in a lot of ways. It's not perfect, uh, but it's amazing what you can do. The computer tech, the support from the computer department and the support from our technology integrators and, and our librarian in the high school has been phenomenal. Um, but I do want to say that from a teacher's standpoint, there is little about what they are doing on a daily basis that has yet become habit. Um, it's like driving a car. Uh, when you first start learning how to drive a car, you have to think about everything. Um, eventually that becomes more automatic, but right now teachers are absolutely still in the stage of having to think about what they're doing balancing the kids at home, staying on top of them, all the cabling and the wiring and the microphones and the monitors, and it's a lot. And frankly, even when it does begin to get more automatic, uh, there are still gonna be a lot of cables and wiring and technical things that can go wrong and that sort of thing. So it, it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, and then what they are also doing, and this is true in all three schools, is on the fly, they're sort of adapting curriculum to the time that's available to cover the curriculum. Um, and so that means that for the most part, even our most experienced teachers have lost a lot of the lesson plans they might have fallen back on in the past um, as staples of what they've done successfully, subject to tweaking and that sort of thing. So, so teachers are doing lesson planning on the fly, I would say. Um, I do know that the third, the third point is about time. Um, I do know that there's some concern about the lost class time and teachers hate losing lost class time. I did want to put in perspective that compared to um, our, the amount of class time that we had before, um, when all of our students stayed until 2.25, we really only lost 20 minutes a, a day 
even though our students are leaving, or most of the students are leaving an hour earlier. Some are staying behind to get teacher support. Um, and the reason why there is the loss isn't as much as it seems is that we no longer, we don't have our advisory period and our achievement period and the transition times on either side of that. Um, and that was a decision that we made essentially to put an hour block at the end of the day for student support instead of having the achievement period in the middle of the day with a five minute passing time either way. And that was really a health and safety consideration. Um, having said that, I know that there's, there's, there's the school board and the administrative team with teachers are gonna be looking at class, class, uh, lost, diminished class time and whether there's any way that any of that can be captured back. And we'd certainly look forward to being a part of that conversation. Um, and then finally, I just want to say this, that, um, that School This Way is really interesting and challenging, uh, but, it, but it also has, a, it, it does have a downside and I want to put that on the table. Um, and it, it makes it a lot more challenging to, to do the little things, kid to kid and teacher to kid to build relationships. Um, just because people are wearing masks, kids are, on, are only physically in the building half the time. We are getting up to speed with clubs and activities and those sorts of things. So I think that that is really, really good. I think Jeff Thorick and the coaches deserve a lot of credit for the work that they've been doing. But the hallways of the school are almost eerily quiet compared to what they usually are. Um, and I gotta believe that from student standpoint, the lunches in particular, they are just sterile compared to what they have been. And, and today was a, as an introduction as well, because kids have been doing a great job taking advantage of the outdoors as a place to eat lunch and socialize safely. Um, but we had to change our cafeteria because our cafeteria tables didn't provide for six feet. So we've got student desks in the cafeteria and it's just really different. Um, and I'm sure that all the students and all the staff look forward to the eventual return of everybody to school every single day where we can really do that, that really important job of, of caring for kids and being out there and seeing them take their masks off and talking with them in a much more natural way. There are definitely some losses for all the celebrations that I absolutely have and all the, and I, and I think are well-deserved for both the way that students and parents and, and, and most particularly the teachers um, have really embraced the challenge and are doing the very best job they can. So I think that's my report. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Marcy, as our business manager, would you like to speak? Please. Yes, thank you, Heather. So I'd like to start with where we are at the end of our first quarter for this fiscal year. The normal spending pattern would be 25% by the end of September. And our general fund expenditures are at 22%. So, and I looked at the average for the past four years, for uh, the last four, four years at this same time, we, the average was 23% spent for the last four years. So we're right on target. We are balancing right now, making sure that we have all of our COVID related expenses um, in the grant fund and our general fund trying to go along as planned. And when I compared some of our major categories, slight changes in our categories, um, I just wanted to let you know that we're running ahead in a few and then behind in just a couple. And um, we're having some savings in our other instruction because of the officials that we're not having for games. So we're saving in that. Um, we, we're having a little bit of a loss with the booster payments. So little things like that. Um, we'll be catching up probably with our student and staff support compared to last year where a little bit underspent com compared to the 29% last year. We're at 26% right now. And with our facilities category of seven, uh, category seven, this point in time, we're at 24.2% spent. And last year we were at 38% spent. But right now we entered the year cautiously with our facilities projects. So we will, um, we started the first quarter with a cautious 
uh, effort towards things that needed to be taken care of. And we'll see what time uh, leads us to in the next few months. And Perry could probably uh, follow up with that, but it will be uh, catching up as, this, as the school year takes place. And uh, that percentage will probably come back right in line. So that's where we are with our expenditures. Are there any questions right now? Yes, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, since the building committee is about to get going again, and this sort of falls under the, the financial side, would you be able to kind of remind us and remind the public about the um, state revolving renovation fund projects that we applied for last year and um, what have we what have we done and what have we spent toward those this year? Yes. Yes, so last year we were awarded by the state $390,429 for the school revolving renovation fund. And we that was for six projects they gave us six out of the 12 that we applied for. And at this time, we have completed one of the projects. We completed the intercom project, the sound system, and that was for 44,410, so that's completed. Five of the projects during COVID, we had some problems getting uh, contractors to bid for the projects. So what we decided to do with the architects and engineers is to just take um, some time out with those five and they are going to start the bid process um, now. So this month we will be doing the bid process again for contractors and see if now if we have an appetite from the contractors uh, now that we're underway a little bit with some safety measures that uh, people have learned how to do and see what we get. And then our plan is to have these five projects completed over Christmas break. And we will still be within our time period. We have until this coming summer. That we was going to be my question. <laughs> yes, we have until July of um, 2021, but we definitely, that's the goal is to have that process, all of these completed by this Christmas. And then we will start um, being able to pay the, the loan on the, the small portion that we have to pay back. Thanks, Marcy. You're welcome. Anything else? Okay. Thanks, Marcy, and thank you for that reminder. Um, so Kathy is the Director of Teaching and Learning, Kathy Stenkert. Hi, good evening, everyone. I am going to update you on um, three different areas. Um, professional development is the first. Our uh, first half Day, PD Wednesday, Professional Development Wednesday was last Wednesday. It was rescheduled from September 30th when the schools lost power. Um, and uh, we had so many presentations planned that it just wasn't, wasn't feasible. So we met last Wednesday instead. And uh, representatives of the recertification committee explained the new process for earning recertification credit. This is a very big deal. It represents the first change um, in over a decade. Um, and the, uh, the reaction to what those representatives had to say uh, was, was very positive. Um, it's something that we'd been working on for about a year. Changes are intended to make the process more meaningful, efficient, and fair by emphasizing reflection over forms uh, using Google instead of paper. So everything will, will be electronic um, and allowing district and school-based professional development to count. Um, which uh, just as far as fairness goes, just, just that was a significant improvement. So, and then after they spoke, we had representatives of the evaluation committee review, reviewing elements of the evaluation plan, including the decision to start mini observations this November. This was to give um, our educators, you've heard tonight about how much, um, really how much our teachers have had to do to sort of completely revamp um, what and, and, and how they teach. And so they asked for a few weeks um, to, to, to uh, feel a little bit more confident what they're doing um, before, before those mini observations began. And uh, we were very happy to, to honor that request. Um, and they also reviewed how to use TeachPoint, our, our uh, data management system for supervision and evaluation. 
And, uh, and then finally, our educators watched a video on accessibility considerations when teaching online. Clearly, how to teach in an online or hybrid uh, learning environment is going to continue to be an important focus of our professional development this year. So the second area I want to update you on is uh, English Learner Services and Gifted and Talented servants, Services. Um, screening of our potential English learners has been completed. Currently, there are 21 students who are receiving EL services, 12 at Pond Cove, 4 at the middle school, and 5 at the high school. And uh, we have um, a one teacher and a half-time ed tech providing those services. As far as gifted and talented goes, currently there are 44 students in grades five through eight who are receiving GT services. I think you'll recall that the identification process for the fourth graders had to be suspended last year because of COVID-19, um, but we, uh, we were able to resume that screening and identification process in September and plan to start services for those identified, excuse me, for identified fourth graders by the end of this month. And then finally, I wanted to talk briefly about the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force. Uh, educators who expressed interest in these issues last spring and summer and who participated in related events were invited to attend the first meeting of the task force, which took place last week. Um, and we began by reviewing the school board's uh, charge in, in adopting the task force. Um, to create and implement an action plan designed to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion in the Cape Elizabeth schools with a focus on curriculum, professional development, and climate culture. We had 18 people attend that, this initial meeting. Um, and because they are people who have already engaged in this work, we spent time on what their hopes and fears are uh, for, this for this initiative and on exploring what we mean by diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our plan for the next meeting, which is in two weeks, well, a week after, I guess really just next week, um, we're going to discuss how to involve students and other missing stakeholders. Um, I was intentional on our part to um, start to think things through a little bit um, and then begin developing goals and planning action steps. And we are also in the process of assembling teams to participate in the Cultural Competence Institute that's sponsored by the Maine School Superintendents Association, the Maine School Boards Association. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's about it. Was there any questions? <laughs> Laura? <laughs> <laughs> No, I was reading the agenda here, and then this one tapped on my knee, and I didn't hear her at all. Yeah. One of your that students is yeah, here. Yes. <laughs> no question. Any other questions for Kathy? Okay, thank you for that, Kathy. Uh, Dell, our Director of Special Services. Thank you, Heather, and good evening. Everybody. There you are. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Uh, just a couple of things to update with regard to special education. Um, the staff have been working very diligently uh, to conduct progress monitoring updates for all students at all three schools. Um, they've also been very busy prepping and attending IEP meetings as we are attempting to get caught up on the backlog. I also want to uh, uh, thank the building admin for assisting in the facilitation of these meetings as um, we are also trying to maximize the access to staff on Wednesdays. So many of these meetings are taking place on Wednesdays. So it's the least intrusive with regard to students, student programming. Um, staff are settling into a working routine with regard to the hybrid remote model. We have started some discussions and planning with regard to what a transition to full remote would look like at the individual student level. Um, should, should that be required in the future? And um, the number of students, students we are currently serving in special ed are 171 students across the district. We have 16 students in referral and two students are outplaced. Thank you, Dal. Any questions? I just want to thank you, Dell, on 
for all the work that you're doing with the special education and the services and providing for um, this particular group of students. Um, I know it's been challenging and I know the IAPs have been difficult over time. So it's good to hear that those are starting up a little bit. And so um, and thank you so much for all you're doing. You're welcome. And I should say that staff and parents have been wonderful throughout this entire process as we're trying to figure out what makes the most sense at the individual student level and they've mm -hmm. everyone's been wonderful to work with yeah that's great i imagine that um with special services there's that extra level of complexity um so thank you for all you're doing um and then we have our superintendent wolfram so just to remind people that we are um, now into the fourth week of our academic year, the sixth week of really having students in our buildings. And I keep knocking on wood and saying every day that we have our students and staff in the buildings is a blessing. And I, I truly believe that. Um, just to echo what you've heard tonight, uh, teachers are working really, really hard. Um, this is a huge adjustment, um, the, the hybrid as well as those who were um, you know, working with the remote students. Um, it's, it's just, it's a new territory and um, it's like being a new teacher again. We have many teachers who have worked for quite a few years and they um, haven't made a lot of changes um, in the routine and all of a sudden we've just turned the world upside down and um, everything takes longer. Planning takes a longer time. Um, People who have felt really successful in the past are questioning themselves and having to um, rethink how they're doing everything. Um, and that's, that's just a, a stressful place to be. Um, they're trying to figure out, you know, technology, schedules. Um, Jeff was talking about the difference in building relationships with their students. That's different. Planning with their peers. When do you do that? Um, just so many things that they've um, that they've had to change. It's, um, it's really been a lot for them. And when we think about those Wednesdays, we have to think that um, you know, they are busy doing things um, and they really need the time. I know I've been trying to meet with some teachers and it's really difficult to find time to meet with them um, because their schedules are so jam packed full. Um, Administrators agreed before um, school started when we were working in the summer that we would um, give, give it till the end of October and then really reevaluate um, everything that we're doing. We've decided that we are, my, sorry, my cat is meowing. <laughs> um, um, we are going to um, put a survey out to um, parents and to uh, staff about the third week in October and then the administration will review um, review um, the data that we get back and um, consider next steps. But we do have some um, constraints that we have to work with them and as far as I know the constraints are, um, are still there. Um, you'll remember that we are under the um, CDC orders for the three feet social distancing in our classrooms and six feet for eating. And that, that hasn't changed. Um, most of our classrooms are pretty small and uh, with the three foot requirements for social distancing, it really does limit the number of students that we can have in our rooms. So I know that we would all like to have all of our students back five days a week, but we are still under um, those uh, CDC orders. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, uh, also, our, our buildings are old and now that we're, it's getting cold out and we're having to close some of our doors and windows, um, the ventilation was uh, adequate for older buildings and for when we could open our windows and doors. I know being in, in the schools, you walk down and there were breezes blowing the uh, papers on the bulletin board um, and as they as the fresh air came in and the, all the windows were open but um, it is it will be getting colder and it is getting colder and um, thinking about our occupancy data and if we want to bring more students into our classrooms we're really we're really limited with the numbers of people that we can have in our classrooms during this COVID time. We did just receive another federal grant 
um, for uh, $1,098,298.68. So that's our second um, large grant. And we're making plans to spend a large chunk of that on uh, improving the ventilation in our buildings. And we did just get um, some uh, plans from uh, Colby and Company of, uh, of what we can do for that. And it will take uh, over half of that federal grant, but if we want to get people back in our buildings, if we want to get more students and, and our, all of our staff back in our buildings, we are just going to have to uh, spend the money. Another constraint we're working under is the fact that this grant needs to be spent by December 31st. So um, we will be, um, Perry will be <laughs> contacting um, some builders, uh, some, some uh, mechanical services people, um, to start that work and we're probably going to have to do the work while, while students are in the buildings. So uh, because December 31st is coming. So we'll, uh, we'll have to figure out how we're going to do that, but we need to, um, we need to, to get that work, work going um, with that uh, time frame. And that is, that's coming from the feds, not from the state. Um, uh, so we do have to spend that by December 31st. Um, you'll remember that we've had to close some of our classrooms that don't have adequate, adequate ventilation. Some of the smaller classrooms um, where um, smaller groups of students were meeting with um, special services um, support staff. Mm -hmm. So we've had to move those uh, students and teachers into some of our larger classrooms. So we really do, while we have a lot of students um, learning remote, uh, in the remote program, our classrooms are, are mostly all being used, so we don't have a lot of extra space there. Um, so um, we'll continue to assess our students for safe and make safe places for, for our students and our staff, um, keeping in mind the three feet social distancing and um, working to improve the ventilation standards um, in the winter months, um, but it does limit the number of students. I've, I've had a number of parents who have asked, you know, when, when are you gonna get everybody back in? And it, we are really under some constraints for, for getting students back uh, into our classroom safely. And um, we've worked really hard to make our schools safe for our students and our staff. And I think that shows with um, the wonderful things that have been happening and, and uh, the fact that we have um, been able to have students and staff in our buildings and um, so we will continue to work on that. I would also like to thank um, the community and the parents for their dedication to the safety. Um, we've talked a lot about how it takes a community and that this will take a community to keep our schools open. Um, people are working hard on uh, wearing masks and the social distancing, hand washing and the sanitizing uh, efforts and we have to, we can't let our guards down. We have to continue, we have to continue with that work and with our dedication. So I wanna thank everybody for that effort. Elizabeth. Donna, I wanted to ask you really quickly about the new DOE guidelines that were released. I happened to see them published by the Cape Elizabeth School Department where there was a chart um, about, you, you know, if you have these symptoms, don't go to school. And it was like four steps. And something new was the bottom one that says, if you leave the state, call your school. And so that seemed really new to me because all along we've been hearing if you go to, or at least in our school district, we're following the list that the governor has said, this is, this is the, the okay list. So are you asking parents are, to now, if we go to New Hampshire, to come home and then call the school and say yeah, we've been to New Hampshire. We're following those, um, those guidelines and honoring the safe states. So okay, I think so we more, don't have to call. No, I think it was more if you have, if some people have questions and they're not just sure about the CDC guidelines. So um. okay. that's good to know because I think you'd have a lot of phone calls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now that Massachusetts is a safe state, that's, that opens that up. That's, that's, made, um, that's made a difference for people as well who have relatives in Massachusetts. So that's been a good thing. 
I hopefully think it's so. Good, hopefully it's a good thing. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Thank you, Donna. Um, moving on to new business, may I have a motion? I know you want to do it, Laura. Do you have a motion? No, I was giving somebody else the opportunity. That's what I was doing there. So I move we consider uh, the following nomination for fall coaches. Amy, uh, I don't want to butcher this last name, Amy Deveries, and it's 50-50 with A.G. Gillis. May I have a second? I second. Thank you, Hope. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, it's nice to see that we're hiring some fall coaches. Yep. <laughs> there was a time when we weren't sure that this was going to happen. This isn't a new position or a new hire. It's for the cross country assistant coach. Um, all in favor, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Nasser is not here. Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. <clears throat> Fantastic. Um, and then there's another motion. I have a motion, please. I move we approve the following 2020 through 2021 administrative personnel and extracurricular nominations as set out in our packet. I have a second. Second. Uh, any questions or comments? Great. Um, I'm always impressed by this list. Um, we've heard of the teachers being so uh, overwhelmed with this new way and of teaching with hybrid and remote learning and to step in and being willing to support these extracurriculars, which as the student rep mentioned, create a little bit of normalcy in this very difficult time. Um, tremendous gratitude to all of these uh, teachers willing to step in. Uh, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Nasser's not here. Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Great. Um, next up is a notification of retirement. Jeff Shedd, our principal of the Cape Elizabeth High School, has announced his retirement. We'll be here throughout the year, um, but then we'll enjoy a little bit of space and free time. So, Jeff, can I just, I know we're not here to honor you right now, but can I just ask how many years? Is this for you? Is it 18? This, <clears throat> this is my 20th year, Heather. 20th. Yep. Wow. I hope we get to be in person and definitely celebrate you. Um, congratulations on retirement. I, um, yeah, you, will, you have big shoes to fill. It will be a challenge for us to find somebody that can fill your space. So. Um, okay, consideration to approve, is this a motion? May I have a motion, please? I move we approve Megan O'Neill for the Pond Cove Elementary School counselor position. May I have a second? Second. Uh, any questions or comments? I have to say I'm thrilled that we were able to fill this position that we, um, I know that back during the budget season, it, um, it was something I believed in strongly when it got brought up um, in the conversations. And um, I know finances were wondering what positions do we actually fill this year. And so I was thrilled to find out that this was a position that could be filled. Um, does anybody else have any questions or comments? Okay, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. 
Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Cypries. Yay. Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Okay. Uh, so item E, may I have a motion, please? I move we approve the 2020-2021 school, school, school board goals. Number one, support the strategic plan goals. Number two, complete the building committee process and make a decision on how to provide safe and effective schools. And the third, support the work of the diversity, equity, and inclusion task force. Thank you. May I have a second? <clears throat> second. Second. Um, I haven't done that, Elizabeth. <laughs> I know, I'm just trying to help keep things moving. It's all good. Um, first of all, I just want to, I just want to explain very quickly that at the beginning of the meeting, uh, I mentioned quickly the five strategic planning goals. And um, just to clarify that those are goals that were created from a wide variety of uh, constituents, um, members of the community through an extended future search process. Um, there are goals that we hope to have throughout the year, uh, excuse me, for five years. And, uh, these school board goals are um, a little bit more specific. They're geared towards this specific year. Um, we, uh, um, we, we, in our school board retreat, decide on what sort of rises to the surface and um, is our priority. Some goals stay and continue year after year after year because they never get complete other goals we can feel like that's that can be taken off and other goals might have to stay for a few years and so these are along with the strategic planning goals are sort of what guide i think a lot of our decision making and how we move forward um, in the work that we do um, I want to know if there's any uh, questions or concerns regarding um, the super, the, not the super, the school board goals here for 2020 and 2021. Okay, I would actually like to bring up a discussion around the support and work of the diversity, equity and inclusion task force um, in the sense um, to be sure that as a board um, we are comfortable and on the same page and we have this opportunity in our business meeting to communicate with the uh, public a little bit about this. Um, we did vote on this uh, diversity equity DEI task force uh, back in our September board meeting. Um, and I think the creation of this diversity equity and inclusion task force sort of um, bubbled up from uh, from desire that was from the public and the teachers. There was an extensive letter with many teachers' signatures written to the school board um, calling for action, calling for um, approaching anti-racism and the movement that is happening right now. Um, over the summer, uh, Kathy alluded to this, there was work being done, there were book clubs and professional development, and there was obvious interest from various, um, from various um, teachers within the community. And so um, our moving into um, this task force became something um, to, to show support, in my opinion, um, as the school board to show support that, that we find this valuable work um, that was already starting to, to begin and to allow and, and welcome the ability to have it be somewhat fluid, as Kathy said, the idea is to open to bringing in students um, and, uh, and, and take it from there. I want to make sure, I, I think there may be some confusion of this task force um, because we voted um, being under the school board purview or whether it's from, um, you know, whether it's a school side of things where the administrators and, and the staff are really working it and it's more like um, an advisory group that board members participate in and, and pull in the information for the public to communicate in these bigger board meetings. 
Um, my understanding was that, um, and it's obviously important to all of us as a board because we decided to make it one of our goals. Um, I saw this, um, this uh, I have it right here. I'd like to read what we voted on. We voted on consideration to create a Cape Elizabeth School District Task Force to address DEI within the district to be compromised with several board members, administrators, teachers, and students, because there's a lot of energy behind the DEI movement. And in an effort to keep this going, a committee is formed to keep the conversations going. Um, my understanding was that um, there is a call to, uh, to approach curriculum. There is a call to approach the culture within the school to make it more inclusive. Um, and that a lot of that work needs to be done through the professional development work that Kathy has referred to, through the teachers, um, really having some very challenging conversations. Um, and I heard that Thursday in the meeting of really facing some of their own shadow sides and being willing to admit like, maybe I haven't been doing this as well as I could and the humility that, that comes with that. Um, I thought it was a very powerful and potent meeting on Thursday to hear the passion of these teachers really genuinely wanting to make change. They correct me or speak up if you heard this differently. I think one of the greatest fears that I heard from everybody there was the fear that it would get lost. The fear that there was initial energy to move forward but that they really want to make strides and have teeth in this and to move forward. Um, and so the most passionate people thus far who have expressed themselves were, who have been involved, had initially been invited to the table and um, that can be fluid and moving, but it's, it's gonna be hard work. It perhaps may be slow work. The other thing, the other fear that teachers had was that they don't have the bandwidth to add more to their plate right now. Um, and so I wanna publicly say that I, I, I hear that and I honor that and maybe the progress is slow, um, but I believe there will be progress because of what I heard from these teachers speaking. Um, I think it is very worthy of us as a board right now um, to be sure that we are on the same page and to be clear about this task force and how we want to move forward. I saw the vote again as support um, for the work that was sort of started and then morphed into this DEI task force. Um, but I'm not sure that is the will of the entire board. Um, and so I want to confirm that we are on the same page with that. I am open to hearing other board members if you want to raise your hand and comment and this would be a really great place to have this conversation in public and kimberly i can't see if you physically raise your hand so you could just speak up if you need to kimberly <laughs> thank you it took me a moment i'm on my phone tonight and i couldn't quite find um <laughs> my hand that's okay though. Um, yeah, I, that was, um, my understanding. I think, um, I'm excited to hear about the energy, um, behind this, or uh, in this group, the, um, the task force that's getting started on this. Um, I think it's, it's something that we had talked about and we're interested in moving forward with, um, over the summer, um, but felt like the complexity um, and importance of getting our students back in school um, was was just monumental. And um, so um, I am pleased that we got this on the September agenda and that it is starting to take form and moving forward. Um, and I, um, I, I think I, I support the vision that you described. That that was what I had um, thought we would be doing, and uh, and I, I support Kathy um, 
as the chair for this, I, I think uh, it's it's hard hard work, a hard task, um, and um, and one that I, I think is so critically important. Okay, so seeing no other comments, um, I guess I would, this isn't a vote, but to see a straw poll that um, we are here for this task force to support the work of Donna and Kathy and the administrators and teacher as they move forward. Um, I'm seeing Laura nod her head, yes. Um, and that seems like a majority. Um, Elizabeth, I saw you nod your head a little bit there. Um, Hope, I'm not seeing, sorry, my phone is coming in to Klein. Are we, we're, con we're affirming what we voted on earlier in the year? Is that what we're doing? Kind of, we're just clarifying that okay. um, we're leaving the work to the administrators and having, it, it, it's like an advisory committee. Um, it, it's, it's not um, like a policy committee Got where it. we run it and Got control it. it. Yep. Um, but it is one where we definitely can be involved and go and participate. And it's I not a school board that, committee is what you're saying. Not a school board it's committee. A, Got it. Okay. And I, I think, understand. That makes I sense. I think there was some confusion because we voted on it that it was officially a school board committee that we should oversee. Um, and um, I think there is, I think the language in what we voted on was vague enough to have it go either way. Um, and so I, I, I want this to be, be the will. That's what I had thought the intention was. And I, I want to make sure that that's the will of everybody on the board. I, I don't, I want us to move into this with, with clarity so that the work can go forward. Does that make sense? Hope did that, explain it a little better. It does. Too. And I, I think it, it does also make sense in that it will have more, um, it will likely have more longevity in that format. As we've seen, there are, it's, it's hard when the school board has sort of, you know, we're, we're in our positions for a certain number of years, and then there's a change in, in the makeup. And um, uh, if it sort of lives outside of the school board, I think it has a, a greater likelihood of success. It sort of becomes more of a community and a district um, endeavor rather than uh, having to be carried by us. And we're sort of limited in our ability to, to act and, and move things because of our, our structure. Okay. Okay. Um, well, thank you. I appreciate this discussion. I think it was worthy to create a little more clarity and to um, send Kathy and Donna off with our blessings to um, and support to, to go ahead and do this work and keep us informed as we go on and, um, and move forward with it. So that being said, if there's no more comments, um, we could start the vote for approving the 2020-2021 school board goals. Uh, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Uh, Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. <clears throat> yay. Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. <clears throat> Thank you. Next on the agenda, may I have a motion? I move we approve the peer mentors as defined in our packet. And a second. I second, Kimberly. Thanks, Kimberly. Uh, any questions or comments? Again, important roles. Thank you, Bri, Amanda, and Fran for stepping up and taking on more responsibility. Uh, Heather Altenberg is a yay. 
Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seyfried. Yay. Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. All right, Phil, I think this is going to be you. Great. Matt, well, thank you. This is motion. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make a motion and I'll, do, and I'll just give a brief summary after the motion about what we're going to vote on over the next four. I think you've separated them to four votes. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to make a motion that the board support. Um, yeah, you do have it as separate votes. Support the following um, main uh, MSBA resolution, which is A, development of a distance learning plan. The coronavirus pandemic ended classroom instruction in school districts and revealed both positives and shortcomings in our ability to do distance learning. What was implemented by necessity should now be improved by design. Distance learning should not just be the fallback in a crisis, but rather used to provide equitable learning opportunities to all Maine students, regardless of location, their location. Okay. That was the motion. May I have a second? Second. Okay, and then discussion. So um, this is my first opportunity uh, in my role as member of the legislative committee. Um, I haven't had a job yet, and this is a, uh, on that committee, and this is my job, which is to attend virtually this year the Maine School Management Association's annual conference, which is October 30th and 31st. And one of the, one of the things that happens at that, and I've learned this, this is my first time attending, is that there is a delegate assembly <clears throat> made up of representatives of school board members, school boards throughout the state. And each school board has a member who votes on behalf of their school board on resolutions. So these are the resolutions similar to we have our school board goals. Um, we just talk about for the year, there are resolutions. Um, there's four of them this year. <clears throat> I just read the first one and obviously it's about distance learning and um, is very um, appropriate. They're, they do provide a rationale. Um, and I just wanted to read that to you so you can understand where it came from. And there is a resolutions committee um, uh, at the Maine School Management Association, um, Maine School Board Association that, that works on these and then it, so yeah, it filters its way up to their executive committee. Um, the rationale here obviously is our, is our experience with distance learning when schools are required to shut down because of COVID and what we will learn as we reopen schools under hybrid models could help us make better use of technology to support instruction and broaden curriculum options for all students. The distance learning can supplement in-person instruction and also support subject areas where there's a teacher shortage. That coupled with increased broadband access is key to educational equity for Maine students. They, they also, as part of this um, resolution, have the Maine School Board Association calls for a plan that addresses professional development uh, for teachers, assessment of devices, high quality connectivity in all parts of the state, development of online curriculum appropriate to age groups, and intentional use of online learning to enhance curriculum and expand learning opportunities for all students. And that and they will, they're arguing that funding for online learning should be part of the school funding formula. So that's the background on this particular resolution. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? <clears throat> okay, we'll vote. Um, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seyfries. Yay. Hope Straw? Yay. And Laura Danino? Yay. All right, may I have a motion? Uh, I make a motion that the uh, Cable School Board support the MSBA resolution B, Building Stronger Family Support for Education. The Maine School Boards Association believes greater involvement by parents or guardians in their ch child's education is essential to assure better outcomes for students. Parents or guardians who are not engaged in their child's early learning at home are less, less likely to be engaged when their child goes to school. I have a second. Second, thank you, Laura. Any questions or comments or any information, extra information, Phil? 
Uh, the rationale here is that there's no question that uh, uh, parental involvement improves educational outcomes for students, but not all parents know how to reach out or feel comfortable doing, doing it. Many working parents and caregivers also have schedules that don't make school visits or teacher contacts easy. School boards working with their administrators should facilitate that engagement, which supports better outcomes for ch children and adults and opens up opportunities uh, for both. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, Phil. You're welcome. <clears throat> okay, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Uh, All right, I'll another make, motion, please. <clears throat> yeah, I'll make a motion that the Cables of the School Board support the MSBA Resolution C, Equity in Education. All students, regardless of their race, color, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, ancestry, natural, national origin, or disability deserve equitable opportunities and support to learn in Maine's public schools. I have a second. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Phil, do you have anything to add to that? Um, Yes, in fact, I think it kind of, this one sort of dovetails into the conversation we just had before this. Um, the Maine School Boards Association believes all district leaders should facilitate a self-examination and discussion around recognizing bias and stereotyping and adopt policies and practices that eliminate them. Bias exists sometimes in overt actions in our schools. There should be high aspirations for all students. There's a growing awareness that bias is often not recognized or acknowledged in our public schools. It will require an intentional process to change practices that lead to stereotypical behavior and help assure that all students have equal opportunity to succeed. Important stuff for sure. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, Heather Altenberg, yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Thank you. And one more, Phil. I make a motion that the Cable of the School Board support the MSPA um, Resolution D, Board Meeting Remote Participation. The Maine School Board's Association believe what we have learned about remote participation in board meetings during the coronavirus pandemic supports a law change allowing such participation absent a health emergency. The technology is available to allow robust discussion on issues and real-time face-to-face deliberations, not only with fellow board members, but with the public. I have a second. Second. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Phil, is there any? Yeah, so for this one, the MSBA supports introducing legislation in 130th legislature, the next legislature, that would allow such meetings under the public records law if the local school board votes to adopt the practice. People's uh, experience with remote participation in meetings during the pandemic has increased the public's comfort level with programs like Zoom and Google Meet. While we're not advocating that all meetings be remote, the option gives school boards greater flexibility. If the legislation is successful, the decision to use this option should be a local one. That's the rationale. Any questions or comments from other board members? Um, okay, Heather Altenberg, yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. May I have a motion? Thank you for all of that, Phil, and thank you for the work and the willingness to participate. So I move we approve uh, the lease documentation with Apple Financial Services. This was included in the adoption of the um, FY 2020-2021 budget articles and is part of the four-year rotation plan for new iPads. The purchase price has been provided in the amount of $156,449.50. May I have a second? Second. Any questions or comments? 
Yes, Elizabeth. Um, I would just like to remind the board and the public, um, going back to a comment that we had earlier this evening about um, examining technology use and um, what may be more useful or less useful, especially to our high school students. Sometimes um, budgetary constraints force us to do maybe not the absolute best option that we possibly can provide in the entire world. Um, we had extensive presentations from um, technology, from Jeff Shedd, from multiple people um, at a finance committee meeting in the library when we were still allowed to do so over a year ago, maybe it was even two years ago, examining our technology plan. And the consensus was that we thought that laptops were better, but the consensus also was that we can't afford them. And so there were three tiers. There were Apple laptops or MacBooks, and um, then there were iPads with hard, well-connected keyboards. And then at the lowest level, there were Chromebooks, which should prove to be um, the least useful and um, least accessible. So um, we went with sort of the middle option. And um, I have a high school student and I have a middle school student and my middle school student has a school issued laptop and my high school student has a school issued iPad. And you know, parents at home, we have um, laptops and I know that we're lucky and it does um, you know, there is, there is that disparity of families that are able to provide laptops and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, I think we're doing the best that we can. And I would not, I don't, I, I do argue that they, they're not useful. My high school student um, has found a way to make it work. And we have a printer that prints from the iPad. And I mean, there are ways to do it. There, we just don't have endless resources. So just throwing that out there. Thank you for that, Elizabeth, for the reminder that we did have extensive discussions about it um, and that it was thought out. And I appreciate your words and comments. Anything else? All right, Heather Altenberg is yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Hope Straw. Yay. Laura Danino. Yay. Uh, heading into first readings of policies, Hope. Uh, yes, so we have, uh, these are all first reads. Um, so I will just quickly go over what's, what we're looking at. And what these are is um, every so often there are um, changes in the statutes and we'll get uh, input from council or we'll uh, get news um, updates from the Maine School Management Association around things that we need to be updating uh, on the lookout with our policies. So these are all driven by that, um, um, those updates. So um, it's ACAD, which is the hazing policy. Um, and there's some this one's kind of more of a cleanup in that it uh, more closely tracks the statute and the statutory definitions of what hazing is. Um, whereas our existing policy sort of had a, it loosely discussed what the law talks about, but then also went on to talk about um, injurious hazing may also include, et cetera. Whereas the, the new version is very tight in terms of main statute defines injurious hazing as, um, and then it also takes out um, definitions that we had in our policy, which are not necessarily um, uh, uh, exhaustive def definitions, and, and they're, they're likely a little bit more misleading than, than helpful. Um, so the, the definition of harassing behavior and active intimidation are not part of the, the new version of the policy. Um, so at any rate, the, the overall change there is kind of to tighten it up and bring it in line with the, the statutory um, uh, definitions. The others are, um, we have IJNDB, which is the student computer and internet use policy and the, the dash R, which is the, um, the procedures. 
And that one also, um, it's sort of in, uh, it's more, more of an issue now because we have so much uh, usage of the school um, equipment. And uh, this one also is, a, is a, a cleanup a bit where it takes out, our existing policy has, a, has the concept of privately owned computers where we talk about family owned computers or, or um, uh, uh, equipment that the students might be using outside of school uh, equipment. And that's been taken out um, we also clean up, um, you know, references to I iPods and iPads, which isn't that's technically correct, and cleaned it up to say tablet. Um, and then also there's other pieces in the computer and internet use policy that aren't necessarily things that can be enforced or tracked. Uh, so as a pra practical matter, um, we have students who, who may need to be downloading software, for example, and our existing policy had a prohibition on that without the express consent of the technology department, which is just a sort of a, um, uh, a lo uh, not logistically feasible um, and, and inaccurate. Um, so that's, that's student computer and internet use. And then the last one is J-I-C-K and the, the dash R, which is bullying and cyberbullying. Um, and this one, um, so the bullying policy uh, takes, um, takes a fair amount of um, detail around reporting, um, the process for reporting the school's response and remediation obligations and pulls it into the policy itself. So it's now a little bit more, uh, it's an informative policy. It's not typical that those items would be in the policy itself, but I think that that's done uh, intentionally um, to make it more uh, accessible to a, a student or, or individual who's looking for that information if they're going to the bullying or cyber bullying policy. Um, and again, those are all, this is all first reading. So we'll meet again um, at the end of this month on Tuesday, the last Tuesday of the month. And uh, any comments or questions, please, let me know now or, or send them our way. Right. Um, I have a question. I feel like um, Hope, I, I feel like the JICK was re recently looked at. Am I misunderstanding that? Well, do you know when the last time we reviewed yeah, that I, was? I, that one has been, that's been part of our, our discussions a lot because it's referenced in ACAA. So okay. Um, okay, they, that's why. the two are intertwined. So ACAA can also bring you to the, to the cyberbullying piece. Okay. Uh, and All then right. we, we also looked at um, ACAD hazing like yesterday. <laughs> so, <laughs> all of these, this is, this is like Groundhog Day. <laughs> it, they just keep coming back. They keep coming right. back. We haven't lost anything substantive or material. They're, they're being refined. They're, they're sort of, yeah. I, I, I think they're, they're improving. So it's incremental improvements is what I would call it. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, school board agenda requests. Are there any agenda requests? And committee reports, um, paths. We have our first meeting this week, later this week. I believe it's Thursday morning. Um, it will be virtual. So um, next month I'll have a report for that. But as of now, there is nothing to report. Um, policy, Hope, do you have any more to add or is? No. Uh, just, uh, just that um, we, we may try to pull um, the cell phone usage policy. No, no, not may, we will at the next meeting on October 27th. Um, it was on the agenda for last month, but we felt it was really important to make sure it was well advertised as the administrators will have an interest in that one. Um, so cell phone policy will be at least a first read. Um, uh, we'll touch on it on, on October 27th. Okay. Um, and then and the DEI, I think that's been discussed a bit today between Kathy and myself. Um, I don't really have anything more to add to that. Announcements of upcoming meetings. Um, we have a building committee meeting October 20th um, at 6.30 via Zoom. 
Um, Hope just mentioned the policy committee, which is October 22nd at three o'clock via Zoom. School board workshop, our next school board workshop is October 27th at 6.30. And then our next um, DEI meeting is next week, as Kathy mentioned. Um, So that will, that work will continue as well. May I have a motion, please? I move we adjourn. Can I have a second? I second. All right. Uh, all those in favor? I can't say, so I'll go Heather. It, Heather Altenberg is a yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Phil Saucier? That's okay. Sorry, I let him mute. Uh, yay. Uh, Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Hope Straw. Yay. Laura Danino. Yay. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great night. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.